Hello and welcome to the reading of Owls in the Family. Now you can see the owls that are in the family. Wool and Weeps. This book is by Farley Moat and this is the reading of chapter 8 of the book Owls in the Family. Before we start the reading of Owls in the Family chapter 8, I want to share a few vocabulary words with you. This one is sandbar. A sandbar is a ridge or hill of sand in a river that is under the water or sometimes gets big enough that it actually comes above the water. These can move and are built by moving water. So the water can move the sand to another location also. In chapter 8, it mentions a Dutchman. <laughs> a Dutchman is a person from Netherlands and Northern Europe. So here is Europe and the Nor Netherlands are right here in the top of Northern Europe. And the Netherlands, a person from the Netherlands is called a Dutchman. So a man from Netherlands would be a Dutchman. It says skylarking in this chapter. Skylarking just means playing around or playing jokes on people. Skylarking. And in chapter 8, they use the word galumphing. It means to move along in a heavy or stomping way, like a, a large animal would, but something that a person or a dog can do, or any animal can do, especially if they're unhappy or sad, they might galumph along. Galumphing. And that one's for chapter 9. And if you'll remember, this book is set in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, a place in the country of Canada. And there is little Saskatoon right there. Let's read chapter 8 of Owls in the Family. Chapter 8. The banks of the Saskatchewan River are very steep. Where the river ran through the prairie to the south of Saskatoon and about two miles downstream from the city was a perfect place for digging caves. Bruce and Murray and I had our summer headquarters down there in an old cave some hobos had dug a long time ago. They had fixed it up with logs and pieces of wood so it wouldn't collapse. You have to be careful of caves because if they don't have good strong logs to hold up the roof, the whole thing can fall down and kill you. This was a good cave we had, though. My dad even came there and looked it over to make sure it was safe for us. It had a door made of a piece of tin roofing, and there was a smokestack going through the ceiling. Inside was a sort of bench where you could lie down, and had two old butter crates for chairs. We put dry hay down on the floor as a carpet, and under the hay there was a secret hole where we could hide anything that was specially valuable. The river ran only a hop, skip, and a jump from the, cave, from the door of the cave. There was a big sandbar close by which made a black backwater where the current was slow enough for swimming. Standing right beside the swimming hole was the biggest cottonwood tree in the whole of Saskatchewan. One, <coughs> one of its branches stuck straight out over the water and there were old marks on it where a rope had cut into the bark. An Indian who was being chased by the Mounties a long, long time ago was supposed to have hanged himself on that branch so the Mounties wouldn't catch him alive. We used to go to our cave a couple of times a week during the summer holidays and usually took the owls along. Wool had learned how to ride on the handlebars of my bicycle, but Weeps couldn't keep his balance there, so we built kind of a box for him and tied it to the carrier behind the seat. Mutt and Rex had come too, chasing cows whenever they got a chance or racing away across the prairie after jackrabbits. We would bike out to the end of the 3rd Avenue and then along an old Indian trail that ran along the top of the riverbank. When we got close to the cave, we would hide our bikes in the willows and then climb down the bank and follow the secret path. They were some pretty tough kids in Saskatoon, and we didn't want them to find our cave if we could help it. Wool loved these trips all the way out. He would bounce up and down on the handlebars, hooting to himself with excitement, 
or hooting out insults at any passing dog. When we came to the place where we hit our bikes, we would fly up into the poplars and follow, oh, he would fly up into the poplars and follow us through the tops of the trees. He usually stayed pretty close though, because if he didn't, some crows would be sure to spot him and then they would call up all the other crows for miles around and try to mob him. When that happened, he would come zooming down to the cave and bang on the door with his beak until we let him in. He wasn't afraid of the crows. It was just that he couldn't fight back when they tormented him. As for Weeps, there they are all on his bike with Weeps back there in the box they made for him and wool up there on the handlebars. And there's Bruce back behind him and Mutt and Rex running along beside. Weeps usually stayed right in the cave where he felt safe. One summer afternoon, when we were at the cave, we decided to go for a swim. The three of us shucked off our clothes and raced for the sandbar, hollering at each other, Last one in is a Dutchman. Oh, I forgot one of the, the words to show you. Somehow we missed shucked. Shucked means to remove or take off. They shucked their clothes. They remove them or take them off. The last one in is a Dutchman. In half a minute, we were in the water, splashing around and rolling in the slippery black mud along the edge of the sandbar. It was great stuff to fight with. Nice and soft and slithery. It packed into mushy mud balls and made a wonderful splash when it hit something. Whenever we went swimming, wool would come along and find a perch in the hanging tree where he could watch the fun. He would get out on the big limb and hung over the water, and the more the fuss, the more noise we made, the more excited he became. He would walk back and forth along the wit limb hoo hooing and ruffling his feathers and you could tell he felt he was missing out on the fun this particular day he couldn't stand it any longer so he came down out of the tree and waddled right to the river's edge we were skylarking on the sandbar when we saw him so i gave him a yell hey wool come on there old wool old owl come on out here of course, I thought he wouldn't fly across the strip of open water and light on the dry sand where we were playing, but I forgot. Wool had never any experience with water before, except in his drinking bowl at home. He got his experience in a hurry. Instead of spreading his wings, he lifted up one foot very deliberately and started to walk across the water toward us. It didn't take him long to find out he couldn't do it. There was an almighty splash and a spray flew every which way. By the time we raced and fished him out, he was half drowned. And about the sickest looking bird you ever saw. His feathers were plastered down until he looked as skinny as a plucked chicken. The slimy black mud hadn't even improved his looks much either. I carried him ashore, but he didn't thank me for it. His feelings were hurt worse than he was and after he was shaken most of the water out of his feathers, he went galumphing off. He was mad. Through the woods towards home on foot. He was too wet to fly. Without a backwards glance. Toward the middle of July, Bruce and I got permission from our parents to spend the night in the cave. Murray couldn't come because his mother wouldn't let him. We took Wool and Weeps with us, and of course, we both had both dogs. In the afternoon, we went for a hike over the prairie looking for birds. Mutt, who was running ahead of us, flushed a prairie chicken off her nest. There were ten eggs in the nest, and they were just hatching out. We sat down beside the nest and watched. In an hour's time, seven of the little chickens had hatched before our eyes. It was pretty exciting to see, and Wool seemed as curious about it as, as we were. Then all of a sudden, three of the newly hatched little birds 
slipped out of the nest and scuttled straight for wool. Before we could move, they were underneath him, crowding against his big feet and peep peeping happily. I guess they thought he was their mother because they hadn't seen their real mother yet. Wool was so surprised he didn't know what to do. He kept lifting up one foot and then the other to shake off the little ones. When the other four babies joined the first three, Wool began to get nervous. But finally, he seemed to resign himself to being a mother. He fluffed his feathers out and lowered himself very gently to the ground. Bruce and I nearly died laughing. The sight of the baby prairie chickens popping their heads out through Wool's feather and that great big beak of his snapping anxiously in the air right over their heads was the silliest thing I've ever seen. I guess Wool knew it was silly too, but he couldn't figure out how to get out of the mess he was in. He kept looking at me as if he were saying, for heaven's sake, do something. I don't know how long he would have stayed there, but we began to worry that the real mother might not find her chicks. So I finally lifted him up and put him on my shoulder and we went back to the cave for supper. We had a good laugh at wool, but the laugh was on us before the day was done. After we had eaten, we decided to go down to the riverbank and wait for the sun to set. A pair of coyotes lived on the opposite bank of the river and early evening just at sunset, one of them would climb a little hill and sit there howling. It was a scary sound, but we liked it because it made us feel that this was the olden times and the prairie belonged to us, to the buffaloes and the Indians and to the prairie wolves. Wool was sitting in the hanging tree and Rex and Mutt had gone off somewhere on a hunting trip of their own. It was growing dusk when we heard a lot of crashing in the trees behind us. We turned around just as two big kids came into sight. They were two of the toughest kids in Saskatoon. If they hadn't come on us so suddenly, we would have been running before they ever saw us. But now it was too late to run. They would have caught us before we could go ten feet. The only thing we could do was sit where we were and hope they would leave us alone. What a hope that was. They came right over and one of them reached down and grabbed Bruce and started to twist his arm behind his back. Oh no, what do you think they're going to do? Listen, you little rats, he said. We heard you got a cave someplace down here. You're too young to own a cave, so we're taking over. Show us where it is or I'll twist your arm right off. The other big kid made a grab for me, but I slipped past him and was just starting to run when he stuck his foot out and tripped me. Then he sat on me. Say, Joe, he said to his pal, I got an idea. Either these kids tell us where the cave is or we tie them up to old hanging tree and just leave them there all night with the engine's ghost. Just then, the coyote across the river gave a howl. All four of us jumped a little. What with the talk of ghosts? But Joe said, That ain't nothing, just a coyote howling. You going to tell us, kid, or do we tie you to the tree? Bruce and I knew they were only trying to scare us, but we were scared all right. I was just opening my mouth to tell them where the cave was when Wool took a hand in things. He had been sitting on the big limb of the hanging tree and since it was almost dark by then he looked like a big white blob up there. I don't think he'd been paying much attention to what was happening on the ground below him but when that coyote howled he must have thought it was some kind of challenge. He opened his beak and gave the owl hunting scream. 
Did you ever hear a horned owl scream? Usually they do it at night to scare any mice or rabbits that happen to be hiding near them into jumping and running. Then the old owl swoops down and grabs them. If you've ever heard an owl scream, you'll know it's just about the most scary sound in the world. When wool cut loose, it made even my skin creep. And I knew what it was. But the two big kids didn't know. Their heads jerked up. And they saw the ghostly white shape that was wool up there in the hanging tree. And then they were off and running. They went right through the poplar woods like a couple of charging buffaloes, and we could still hear them breaking brush when they were half a mile away. My guess is they ran all the way to Saskatoon. When they were out of hearing, Bruce stood up and began rubbing his arm. Then he looked at Wool. Boy, he said, you sure scared those two roughnecks, silly. But did you have to scare me right out of my skin, too? Hoo, 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 Wool chuckled as he floated down out of the tree and lit upon my shoulder. I hope you enjoyed that reading of Owls in the Family by Farley Moat. That was chapter 8, and I hope you'll come back and join us for chapter 9.